Um, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, my name is Matt Peterson. For any of you guys who didn't catch earlier, real quickly, um, Mastin Aquarius of the Year 2009. I'm a fish breeder. Uh, among the many things I do, I'm a senior editor for Coral Magazine and the new Amazonas Magazine. And uh, I'm here today to uh, talk about fish rooms, but they're not my area of expertise. So why would I talk about fish rooms? Well, I have this big freshwater history and fish rooms are prevalent in the hobby. Uh, there's not really many real marine fish rooms. When I talk about a fish room, I'm not talking about a filter room. I'm not talking about you know, having a closet that you convert it to hold your skimmer and your filter. Um, I'm talking about an actual room dedicated to multiple tanks, specifically for fish keeping. Um, this presentation I've been working on for over two years. Um, I, I wanted to go out and, and I said, I'm gonna start my own fish room, so I wanna go out and talk to people and say, what's the best way to do this? What's the best way to plumb things? What's the way to run your electric? What's the best sump to use? And all, all these questions, and when I found out there are no universal answers, there are only universal questions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at those questions. We're gonna say, what do you have to think about if you're gonna plan a fish room? And then, you know, the end goal here is to kind of inspire you to, to say, wow, you really can do this and there's many ways to do it. So what is a fish room? Well, you know, it, it's a dedicated functional space where fish are the priority. Um, propagation is generally the mission in a fish room. That's the main goal here. We're propagating, we're breeding. Um, they are always custom because everyone has a different space. Uh, if you go with anything prefab, it tends to be costly. So at a hobbyist level, they always end up being do-it-yourself projects. Um, you definitely cross an invisible line if you're gonna set up a fish room. Uh, it requires a little bit of insanity and uh, it requires spousal permission. Otherwise, divorce is an alternative. There are two forms of divorce, voluntary and involuntary. One's gonna happen if you don't have the spousal permission. So you're, at, you're past this point of, of dabbling. You are really into the hobby if you're gonna set up a fish room. So there are five main systems we'll put in a fish room. Uh, quarantine systems, brood stock, and adult fish uh, containment. You'll generally be culturing some sort of food. You'll have larval culture systems which are dedicated specifically to dealing with the needs of larval fish and then grow up uh, to house juvenile fish and get them ready to, to pass on. Because if you raise a thousand clown fish, you're not gonna keep a thousand clown fish. You have to do something with them. So where do fish rooms come from? You know, I, I alluded to it earlier that you know it starts as a hobby. You know, everything's going hunky dory, nothing's, you know, and then someone lays eggs. And wait a second, I'm gonna breed something. And uh, you raise some babies and you, you enjoy it. And then uh, you raise some more babies. And then uh, along the way you kind of start to realize uh, this isn't gonna cut it anymore, this is ugly, I need functional space, I need a real space to do it. Um, freshwater people have been keeping uh, fish rooms and running out of space for a long time, decades and decades. Uh, and that's where the fish room comes from. There are many incarnations of the fish room. Uh, there's also a lot we can learn from the freshwater hobby. There's, for a lot of people, if you're a hobbyist, you're either a freshwater hobbyist or you're a marine hobbyist. I find very few people overlap. Uh, so we need to sometimes look back and say, well, how did they do it? A lot of the freshwater fish rooms are run very economically with just air-driven filtration. You just have a big blower, everything's driven with air. We don't tend to do that in the marine world because that creates a lot of salt creep and salt spray. Uh, water changes in the freshwater world are generally very cheap and easy. So filtration can be very basic, rudimentary, it's to keep things going in between water changes. Well, a little different in salt water. But this is a typical freshwater fish room. Cinder blocks used to raise things up, uh, two by fours to make a, a frame. You can see all the uh, air being plumbed in, and if you look closely, you'll see various sponge filters and corner filters actually uh, driving the filtration in these tanks and just heating the room. No heaters in these tanks, just heating the whole room to whatever temperature it needs to be. Uh, and there are many variations on this theme in the freshwater world. Um, many different ways to set them up. And, uh, but you can see they all kind of look the same. Um, some, some look nicer and more professional than others, but um, some could be a crazy mess. But this is, this is a functional space. This isn't a display space. This is a workspace. This is a workshop. Um, and you get really nice results. Um, you know, this is a really good example. This is a fish room in, in uh, Portland, Oregon where one of the few people I've run into who keeps both marine and freshwater. Um, so how do we do this for a marine fish room? What, what's it gonna take? Well, each skill that we're about to list 
If you don't have this skill, you're going to have to up the budget. So if you don't know how to do plumbing, you're going to have to hire someone else to do it. Carpentry, electrical work, general DIY skills, and creativity all go into the things that you need to have to do a fisherman. I'm horrible at electrical work, not about to run my own wiring. So yeah, I brought in an electrician, told him what I wanted to do, had it done properly. Um, <clears throat> there's also money. And when I went out and talked to all these people who were keeping marine fishermen, I said, what would it cost you to set it up? And I was given a range, anywhere from $2,000 for a very small hobby room, up to $60,000 for a small business. Um, and by the same token, the monthly expenditures, uh, running a small hobby room, at the lowest end, I was quoted $100 a month just for maintenance, not bringing in fish, not doing anything, just the ongoing recurring costs, $100 a month. On the flip side, running a small business, $2,000 a month. So you know you have to think about the ongoing recurring expenses. And then time. Time is a huge thing you're gonna have to invest if you're gonna have a fish room. If you're gonna run a, a small hobby room, minimally, a couple, couple hours per week, but when you're running a small business, Literally, the, the highest would be every waking moment. Never stops, never goes away, fish never stop breeding and doing the things they do. So where are you gonna put this? Or in the case of my wife, where am I gonna hide it all? So you can put it in a spare room. A lot of people use spare rooms. This is a, actually a second floor. I don't necessarily endorse putting a fish room on a second floor. Um, this is a fish room that started out in someone's living room. Um, basements, I know you guys don't have basements here, but up north we have lots of basements. And a lot of people situate their basements, uh, situate their fish rooms in their basements because a lot of basements are just lost space. It's utility space. Um, you don't finish it out in case of floods. So it's a perfect place to put a fish room. Um, garages, I've even run into a few people who keep their fish rooms in their garages. This is actually a quarantine system for a service company and it's just housed in the garage. The garage is heated. Um, and then people who go really nuts use a new building. You got space in your backyard, set up a building. Um, and we're gonna, I think we're gonna look at both of these a little later. So, thinking about the actual site, the location, you have to think about the weight that you're gonna be putting in this location. I mentioned second floor, uh, not a good idea. Um, you know, we like to say water weighs eight pounds per gallon, but the reality is it's a fish tank. I like to say it's 12 to 15 pounds a gallon because you've got all the equipment, the tank itself. Uh, what kind of floor do you have? Do you need to reinforce that floor? You have to think about the weight because you're not putting one big fish tank, you're putting lots of fish tanks in this place. So if you're doing it on a first floor and there's a basement underneath, can your floor support it? You really have to think about the weight you're gonna put on your floor. Um, and then, what do you do for water? You know, do you need to plumb water into the room? Do you already have it? Uh, there are things to consider like utility sinks, floor drains, where are you gonna put RODI? Uh, where are you gonna store that RODI? Um, how are you gonna mix up your water? How are you gonna dispose of your water? Are you gonna be able to recycle water? Because salt costs money. I said fresh water is relatively cheap to do a water change. We know salt water isn't, and if you're running a few thousand gallons of salt water, think about the cost it took just to make that water and then to do your regular water changes on that water. It adds up really quick. So some people are starting to think about ways to recycle, reuse their water before just throwing it down the drain. Um, and then electrical considerations. Do you have enough service? You're gonna be running a lot of electric. Uh, will that electrical service and the way you've built it stand up to the humidity, will it stand up to salt spray? Um, think about a backup. Because again, we're not talking about one tank of fish. We might be talking about dozens or hundreds. Um, if your power goes out for any length of time, you need to be prepared. You're not gonna be able to just sit there and pour water and pray. Um, drip loops, obviously essential. And then one of the things I've noticed, rarely there is an answer. Uh, putting electric at the ceiling level, because water doesn't run up to the ceiling. Not going to get on the cord and go up to the, to the outlet on the ceiling. So some of the really nicely done fish rooms had their electric all up above, out of the way of the water. And then use, just, use GCFIs. It's a, you know, a no-brainer. You can buy portable ones if you don't already have them uh, installed. But save your life. Don't get shocked to death. Use a, use a G, GFCI. And then temperature. You guys have it easy down here. You're going to be cooling everything. But uh, you know, up north, we think about heat a lot more, so you know, do we heat the room, which is cheaper, uh, or do we heat the tanks, uh, which allows for individual control? In, in my case, you know, I like to heat the tanks because I can keep these fish that like it at 86 or 84, keep them up there, these other fish that don't, keep them lower. You're just the exact opposite here. You're probably gonna be cooling the entire room. It's a lot cheaper to cool the room than to try and run a chiller on every single system. Um, so the humidity and the moisture. 
you know, you have to think about your floor handle spills. Uh, how are you going to control that humidity? Because there's going to be a lot of humidity generated in your fish room. Uh, how are you going to protect the space itself from moisture? Because you don't want to have a mold problem. Um, are you going to run multiple dehumidifiers? What are you going to do to get this stuff done? And then there's even this nice thing called a heat recovery ventilator. In this case, I, I think it would work for a, a cool recovery ventilator. I'm not sure. But the point is, it transfers the humidity out without necessarily transferring the temperature with it. Um, so all things to consider in your space. Um, and then the systems that go in them. Once you've figured out the space, you still have to build these systems. So I mentioned there are five systems we generally deal with. The first one is quarantine. Uh, in a fish room, it's vitally important because you're not gonna screw things up for one fish tank if you make a mistake. You could wipe out everything. So it's vitally important to make sure you quarantine everything that enters in that fish room. Uh, it's important to use isolated systems. You don't quarantine a fish by putting it in the tank on a system with your brood stock. That doesn't work, it has to be separate. Uh, you wanna use dedicated peripherals. That means separate nets, separate hoses. Everything that's gonna go into the tank is for the quarantine tanks and that's all it's for. That way you're not transferring things from one tank to another. You don't go work on the quarantine system where there's some ick running around and then go work on your brood stock system with the same net or the same tube or anything. You need to prevent that cross-contamination. Bare bottoms, inert decorations uh, so that you can keep things clean, so that you're not uh, changing the water chemistry at all. And then there were even some breeders who had gotten to the point, they said, I don't bring in any new fish. Everything's good, everything's great. I, I, I'm cutting myself off. I don't want to bring anything in that's new because it, it stands to disrupt this nice balance I've got going. But a simple quarantine system can be a simple standalone tank. It doesn't have to be a whole system dedicated. And again, it's just very basic. 10 gallon tank, power filter, a couple PVC places for the fish to hide, very basic. Your brood stock system, this is important because you need to keep your breeding pairs separate from each other. Uh, sometimes we can mix multiple types of, of fish in the same brood stock tank. For example, you can have a, a clownfish pair and a goby pair, and they can share a tank just fine. Or a clownfish pair and a dotty back pair, they get along. But you can't put two pairs of oscillators in a 10 gallon tank, it doesn't work. Um, it also reduces maintenance. It's really important to keep your brood stock separate because if you were to tie it in, a lot of people start tying in their grow out with their juveniles, and what they find is, grow out, you're feeding like crazy, it pollutes everything. Well, now you're just polluting more water. So keep it separate, it reduces the maintenance, it reduces your water changes you do for that portion of your fish run. Um, and the nice thing is you need to design it for flexibility to suit your particular project. If you're gonna breed marine betas, you're going to set up different brood stock systems than if you're going to breed clownfish, or if you're going to breed angelfish. You're gonna have to think about the fish you're intending to work with. Or build a system that has a diversity of tanks. So you can house big, species, small species, species that need a, a tall water column to spawn in. Um, think about your particular project. And this is just a classic example. This is a brood stock system for uh, Joe Lithenberg's clownfish hatchery. And uh, these are all cut down 10 gallon tanks. They only hold seven gallons of water. You have these custom done. Clownfish don't need vertical space. They stay in their pots and that's all they do. So you don't need the vertical space. So by eliminating the top three gallons for each one of those tanks, he was able to put three rows instead of two. Um, Larval culture. Larval culture system is designed to meet those needs of the larval fish. You're likely to incorporate black round tubs, I talked about them earlier, and other special rearing vessels. We don't, we don't do a lot of marine fish in glass tanks these days from a larval standpoint. Um, most larval culture systems are designed for low flow because if you have tons of circulation through the filtration system, you're just gonna wash all your babies into it and into a protein skimmer, into a pump, they're done. Um, so you want a very low flow going through and then all, uh, a lot of times you'll have these individual tanks or tubs set up that you can take them offline, that you can run it as a standalone fish tank, turn it on at a later point and add it to the system. So a good example of such a system, these are black round tubs at Edgar Diaz's hatchery uh, up in uh, Michigan. You notice they're all running on central filtration, but at any point you can just take these off. They have their own air feeds, their own heaters. They can function as a standalone environment for baby fish. And then grow out. Grow out systems are designed for heavy loads. You're going to put tons of fish in there. And in fact, the more fish per, per square inch you can put in, the better because you're using less water. Because no matter what you do, you're going to pollute the heck out of that water. So you want to keep that polluted, highly polluted water just to the grow out. You don't want that polluting any other system. Um, you might include larger tanks for larger batches of fish if you're rearing up batches of clownfish and you get 400 in your average spawn, you're not going to put them in a 20 gallon tank. You might need a bigger tank. 
Um, having a large grow out system allows you to segregate batches, get things ready for sale, um, and you might even include smaller staging areas, you know, 10 gallon tanks where you're pulling orders and setting them aside before they're going. Um, some of the other things I want to just talk about for grow out, this is just a good example of a grow out. These are 20 gallon hives. And there are a few hundred clownfish in each one of those 20 gallon hives. We would never tell anyone to ever do that under any circumstance, ever, except for grow out. Because you can change 50% of this water and make it 50% better. This is gonna pollute 60 gallons of water or 200 gallons of water, it doesn't really matter. So the less water you change, the better. The more concentrated you keep your fish and grow out, to some extent, the better. But it does require good filtration, good nutrient management, UV sterilizers, all these good things to really, you know, you're doing something very atypical. You would never dream of putting that many fish in a bio cube that's this big. But this is how grow out really happens for marine fish. And then food culture. It's really simple. You're going to be dealing with phytoplankton for your larva, uh, zooplankton for the larva, maybe, maybe even rearing live feeds for the adult fish. Um, these are just some examples. This is uh, Joe Lichtenberg's rotifer culture, some phytoplankton culture, zooplankton culture. Those were in the earlier presentation. The point is you're going to need a dedicated space for rearing up these, these various live foods. Generally what we do is we keep them separate from the fish, and we generally keep zooplankton separate from phytoplankton. If you're rearing phytoplankton and you get a little rotifers in your phytoplankton, you don't have phytoplankton anymore, you have rotifers. So a lot of people will keep them completely segregated, completely separate from one another. Don't work, them up. Don't work on them at the same time, or if they do, you always work on the phytoplankton first, and then go work on the zooplankton. So how do you set this all up? Well, you can go with prefab systems, and they are out there, they're modular, they are available. And this is uh, just one example. Um, use acrylic retail stations like this. Sometimes you can pick them up, and they're generally very affordable. They take the guesswork out. If you're not a handy person at building systems, finding things like this will, will get you in cheaply. Um, but they're generally not flexible. You don't get the option to swap out these little tanks and put in big tanks. They are built to do what they're built to do. And if you buy them new, they're very expensive. So unless you can pick up some of these prefab systems used, it's gonna be a ridiculous outlay of money. So most people go, do it yourself. And this is kind of how you build it. You're gonna think about the stands, the tanks, the filtration, uh, the plumbing, the lighting, and then all the peripherals that go in. And uh, first off, the stands. We're gonna rack these tanks up. For me, the stands were a weak point. Um, Cause I'm always wondering, is it gonna hold up? I'm not an engineer, am I designing this right? Um, and you have four options. Metal, uh, do it yourself, uh, wood, prefab shelving, and then even the classic cinder block and wood. So wood stands are very affordable. You can always build them to fit your exact needs. They're easy to protect. If you use a, an acrylic paint, something that's waterproof and epoxy paint, they're, they're sealed up, they're protected. Uh, it's nice that you can paint them and set the mood. You don't have to keep them unfinished. And it gives it a nice professional look if you don't have a bunch of raw wood sitting around in your fish room. Uh, salt water, thankfully, doesn't damage wood like fresh water does, because the salt acts as a preservative. But what salt does get to is things like nails and screws. Um, and then basic carpentry, school, uh, carpentry skills and power tools. If you don't know how to work with some basic tools, this is a problem. Um, a lot of people consider do-it-yourself or custom fabricated metal stands. They're expensive, but they're terribly strong. The nice thing, and I mentioned up here, low profile, it's less lost space. If you have a two by four or one by one angular iron, this takes up a lot less space than the same stand that would be, uh, would be built out of wood. In fact, this tank, I don't think you would build it out of wood. But in the case of Joe's systems, in addition to cutting down these tanks, he also used metal. So instead of two by fours, he had one by ones, and he got a lot more headroom to work and to get into these tanks. Um, so generally, the downsides are that you have corrosion to worry about. Um, and then they're generally done by the people who have the skills and the equipment or the money to do them. You can go with prefab shelving if you're not, if you're, not, if you're wanting to stay kind of cheap and you're not very imaginative and you don't have good carpentry skills, it's easy to go out and get prefab shelving of many different varieties that are designed to build a lot of weight. The problem is they're not flexible and they're not designed to do what we want them to do. They're not designed to properly support an aquarium. You could have leakage problems. You could have any number of problems with prefab shelving. So I generally don't look at prefab shelving and say, yes, let's throw a bunch of fish tanks on that. Um, 
But what's been around for decades is cinder blocks and wood. It's very easy to stack up cinder blocks. It's very affordable. It's very strong. And uh, it's really the any idiot can do it approach to building, building up some racks. The only tools you need is pr pretty much a drill uh, to just screw a wood frame together. Have, have a basic wood frame cut by your hardware store, screw it together, put it on top of cinder blocks. I don't recommend standing them vertically like this, um, but I said any idiot can do it. Um, so realistically, this is, this is the no-brainer, and you'll actually see a professional hatchery that looks just like this. Um, so the tanks. This is just a long checklist, a lot of questions. There's no rights or wrongs here. Uh, you know, are you going to go use your news? There, there is obviously a, a new being more reliable, and it affords for a certain amount of customization. Mike and I were talking about 10-gallon tanks, and he wants to drill them. But drilling 10-gallon tanks tends to crack a lot of 10-gallon tanks. So go buy new tanks and have them drilled for you. Um, obviously, if you go used, they're cheaper. But you might have an experience like I did, where you go buy a used tank, and you tear it down, and you look at it, and it was built 15 years ago. and Silicone seals are generally like good for like 10 years anyway, so was that really a good deal? I don't know. Um, again, the materials are important. Acrylic, glass, using something else. Glass I like because it's tough. Acrylic weighs less and it insulates better, so if you're trying to keep a temperature differential between your workspace and the aquarium water, acrylic is gonna help in that regard. Uh, but you can also use fiberglass and plastic, uh, wooden tanks. You can actually build tanks out of, out of a plywood and then coat them in fiberglass and they're ready to go. Um, and then the shape is equally important. Rectangular and round tanks, they both have certain advantages for certain things like the black round tubs uh, get used a lot for larval rearing. Um, special sizes or types, there may be all sorts of things you'll get into if you research saying, I want to breed jellyfish. Well, you're going to need a Chrysler to breed, to breed and maintain jellyfish. Um, and then covered or open top, I'm strongly going to advocate for keeping your tanks covered because it cuts down on humidity, uh, it really cuts down on evaporation, and it cuts down on fish jumping out, which is a huge problem if you don't have covers on your tanks. So it's nice to get tanks, but you gotta remember to buy the tops or make tops. The filtration, again, just a long checklist of things to think about. The sumps and the pumps. Um, Tony Vargas likes to recommend 30 to 40% of your overall system volume be available in the sump. Uh, having a large sump offers a lot of flexibility to add equipment, take equipment out, and a sump can really be any watertight inert container. Um, and then pumps, you know, internal pumps are cheaper, but they add heat. Up in Duluth, I went with internal pumps because my basement runs 60 degrees year round. It's, uh, that heat's not lost on me, that heat is keeping the tank warm. Um, you obviously need to calculate things for head pressure and the overall length of the plumbing. Um, the first system I built, I didn't use, I, I, I didn't use enough. Um, so if anything, go larger than you think you're going to need because you can always throttle a pump back, but you can never make it go beyond what it already does. Um, mechanical filtration is often the first stage of filtration in these systems, and they function very specifically to sequester particulate waste. The whole point is to get that particulate waste trapped and get it out. So you generally want to maintain things like filter socks very frequently. If you stay on top of it, keeps your water quality better. It reduces the amount of water changes you're gonna to have to do. So it's one of these things where if you think about how you're gonna deal with this and you're gonna maintain it, it's gonna save you work in the long run. It's gonna save you money in the long run. So whether you're using filter socks, filter pads, or even those inline pleated cartridges, uh, the canister filters, they all serve a purpose. And again, that purpose is getting the waste trapped and out before it starts breaking down. Biological filtration is simply not optional. It's not optional here. We're not gonna run this off of live rock with circulation and think we're getting enough biological. Um, absolutely, wet dry is a viable option in a fish room. Um, you know, we use bioballs, people are still using DLS rolls in their fish rooms and commercial hatcheries. DLS still works. Um, fluidized sand filters are very popular and I, I believe Mike has one running on back. And then yes, you can still use live rock, but you're gonna use a lot of different biological filtration to keep things under control, especially when we look at putting 200 clownfish in a 20 gallon tank on a system. Um, chemical filtration serves two main purposes here. It's either to sequester or break down organic waste and pollution. Uh, granular activated carbon, it's an insurance policy. We're going to run a lot of carbon. Uh, it really helps with water clarity and it helps, resumed, uh, helps remove dissolved organic carbon that protein skimming uh, may leave behind. And it's actually more effective at removing that. Uh, Ken Feldman has a very nice uh, presentation on how carbon works in comparison to protein skimming. So, 
you are going to also want to consider using ozone. It's a very strong oxidizer, and it kind of fell out of favor in the hobby for a long time. But in a commercial setting, uh, it's very helpful with disease, and it's very helpful with maintaining good water quality. So ozone is definitely something to look into and consider. Um, and again, protein skimmers. They, they do very basic function. I believe everyone in this room probably should know what a protein skimmer does. It reduces and removes waste. It's really helpful for gas exchange, again, because if we're going to cram a lot of fish into a small space, we need to keep dissolved, uh, dissolved oxygen levels at saturation. Bigger the skimmer, easier that's going to be. It's arguably a must-have. Very few people run fish room systems without big, big protein skimmers. And then refugiums. A lot of people don't think about throwing a refugium on a system in a fish room, but you know they, they do a lot of good things for us. They consume waste. They provide for nutrient export. You, harvest that algae and throw it away. They're very economical to set up, and they do provide some, some supplemental feeds, uh, especially on broodstock. You know, you get the occasional copepod or amphipod getting back into the broodstock system. Um, all good things. Nothing bad comes out of, a, out of a refugium. People are also playing with algae scrubbers. And again, it's another technology that's kind of not mainstream in our hobby by any stretch. Um, the basic gist of an algae scrubber like this is there's a sheet of water that's constantly trickling down over this kind of window screen material. It's being lit from both sides, which is standard daylight fluorescent bulbs. You grow a bunch of hair algae and turf algae, and then periodically you just harvest that. That all just goes away and gets thrown away. It's nutrient export, it's very cheap to set up, and it's very effective. And then denitrifiers, bio pellets. Again, we're dealing with tons of waste. Way more waste than you're ever gonna have in a reef tank. So people are really looking at denitrifiers, but a lot of the denitrifiers especially any of the do-it-yourself denitrifiers, are very difficult to set up and maintain. Bio pellets are definitely the new rage in nutrient export, nutrient control, but you have to have really solid protein skimmers running to be doing bio pellets. So people are starting to play with bio pellets on their grow-out systems, and, and they're having good, good results with them. And anytime you can get that waste out and taken care of without doing water changes, you're saving yourself some money. And then UV sterilizers. It's really important, I chose a very specific word here, reduce. They reduce bacterial loads, they reduce cross-contamination, and they reduce disease. They won't fix any of these problems. They are just a helper. And you can run a bank of UV sterilizers, but it's not going to fix an ick outbreak if you have one. It's going to reduce the risk that you have one. That's really the key function of a UV sterilizer. A properly maintained one is really going to help keep things in check. Um, so here's the general suggestions I kind of took from all this. That biological filtration is an op is, isn't optional, and it's fine to have a wet dry. Because wet dries promote gas exchange and break down fish waste. They do two very crucial things very effectively. I say protein skimmers are strongly suggested. Emphasis on you really have to have them. Um, UV sterilizers are a proven technology, and they help cope with the really high fish loads. It's different than keeping a reef tank. You have a lot of fish in a small space. Um, Oversize everything. Because again, we're not dealing with the same amount of waste and the same biological loads that a reef tank would have. We're dealing with much, much more. So everything go way oversize what you would normally buy. Um, and unlike freshwater, those water changes cost money. So you really need to think about nutrient export. Don't underestimate the value that brings to the table. Don't say, I'm just going to keep doing water changes. Um, filtration has to deal with copious amounts of waste, way much more than a reef tank. Uh, so design your systems to be modular, similar in scale. This is a very interesting concept. If you have 10 systems that all use the same pump, the same protein skimmer, the same heater, you only have to have one backup equipment, one piece of backup equipment, so that if any protein skimmer fails, you've got the replacement on hand. If every system is different and something goes wrong and you need to fix it quick, you're either going to have to have a backup for each one of those pieces of equipment on hand, that's a lot of money, we're going to have to rush out and hopefully try and get it. If everything's built at roughly the same size and the same scale, if they all use 100 watt heaters, then you can have just one 100 watt heater on hand ready to go should problems arise. That's very cheap insurance because a lot of us know equipment does fail. If you're going to run a whole series of systems, having that one piece of backup is a lot easier and a lot more affordable than trying to back up everything. And then diversify your systems. A lot of people will build one big system to handle everything, but then that's one big system that if something goes wrong, everything is going wrong. If you have three systems for your broodstock instead of one, 
even if one of those rootstock systems totally crashes, you still have two more that are doing fine. So diversify everything, make everything smaller and modular. It diversifies the risk, it spreads the risk out, it keeps everything much more manageable. Um, so that was one of the things I just picked up from going around and looking at people's setups. So how are you gonna plumb all this together? Uh, are you gonna use PVC or flexible? It's just a question. Uh, are you gonna glue things or not glue things? There are certain things sometimes you don't glue. Uh, this isn't glued, and this isn't even a tight fit because I can easily remove this tank if I need to. This is, does not need to be watertight. Um, keep in mind that larger diameter plumbing is much more proportionally expensive. Um, you're gonna drill your own tanks or you're gonna pay someone else to do it. I would highly suggest for most people pay someone else to do it. Uh, you have the nice opportunity to design a system for easy water changes. You're building a system, plan it out so that it's really easy to change water. So you can mix the water right there, put it right in, flip a valve, flush it out, put in the new stuff, you're good to go. Think about it. This is gonna save you countless hours if you don't have to push buckets around or haul things. So think about how you're gonna do your water changes, plan for it. Lighting on these systems. Um, you can do it with timers or manual. Uh, I strongly suggest most stuff be on timers. You can, in a fish room, just use ambient light. You don't have to even light the tanks. Um, you can use shop lights or you can use aquarium specific fixtures. We're not growing coral here. It's just so you can see what's going on and so the fish have a regular day-night cycle. And then the peripherals. The peripherals are all those things you may or may not need depending on where you are and what you're doing. So things like heaters and chillers, you're just gonna have to look at that. Or you're gonna use controllers. I, for a long time as a hobbyist, never touched a controller. I have a controller now, I love it. I absolutely love it. If something goes wrong on any of my systems right now at home, you're gonna get an email about it. Someone's gonna know about it right away. The people watching my tank are gonna, need, gonna get emails about it. That alone is worth all the headache and all the expense. Um, and you're gonna run air feeds. We don't use air a lot in the marine hobby anymore, but for a lot of our larval rearing in our smaller environments, we use air. So you're either gonna be trotting around a bunch of luff pumps and little air pumps like you buy for a 10 gallon tank, or you design your system with air in mind and build a blower system and have a manifold and have air available at every tank. And I'll tell you, if you really think you're gonna need air, this is the economic way to do it, really saves you saves you from going nuts. Um, think about top-offs, and this is a, a very big do-it-yourself top-off, but there are any number of ways to eliminate maintenance and eliminate work where you can. Uh, and then backups. Uh, I run a nice battery backup on all my controllers so that if the power goes out, uh, I back up my cable modem, and I back up my controllers, I get a message of power's out. You can actually even track for that. Um, so how do you put this all together? How do you take all these questions and, and kind of develop a plan? Well, a lot of people will lay it out. Some people will uh, draw it out. <laughs> um, you know, and this actually, this is the sitting in my basement trying to tell three other guys the plan for a system I'm building, and he goes, what? Oh, well, here, and I just start scribbling it out. Or, you know, you can be a little more you know, organized and outline it, or you can really go nuts and sketch it up. I love SketchUp, it's free. And yes, I can make stuff that looks nice too. It doesn't all look like garbage. Uh, so this is actually just a plan I put together for a, a modular, fit a whole bunch of stuff in a real tiny space, never actually built it. But that's the beauty of it. You can get everything to the exact measurements, play around with it, see how things work. So when I looked at all the used tanks I had sitting around, I could start playing with it and say, well, how could I lay these out in the basement? How could I put this together? What's, what would it feel like? So really nice tool to use for trying to get an idea of what you're gonna do. Just takes a little bit of a learning curve, but most of what we deal with is boxes and cylinders and you can just know the dimensions and put it all together. So the second half of this talk is how it all comes together. And every time I give this talk, I show different fish rooms because I've been to like 15 or 16 at this point. I've got nine in here today. So this is how nine different people addressed all these questions. And again, you'll find there's no consistent answers. So Tom Scaturro runs Diver Tom in Florida. He's a Florida fish collector. He's one of the few non-breeders that I went out and said, this is neat, I gotta put this in, in the system. So he, he sells both wholesale and retail. And about a year ago, he put in this really new holding facility in a new room designed to be a holding facility. Everything is do-it-yourself. Everything's elegantly simple. 
and he really maximizes his space. So, like I said, Tom is a diver and uh, got to go out and uh, do a little fish collecting in Florida with him, which was awesome and incredibly difficult. And I have a newfound appreciation for the work that the people who bring us our fish go through and the things they do to bring us those fish. So, this is Tom's holding facility. This is a room that is maybe half the size of the space you're all sitting in right now. It is not big. This is an entire wholesale operation. And um, this is where he collects rainwater to, to use for top off. Uh, this is a packing station right here with one of the runs. Uh, you'll notice he's got stuff everywhere, below, above. He's maximizing all that space in the fish room. Notice the plywood tanks. These were awesome. Just plywood coated with fiberglass. And uh, this is one of his packing and sorting tables. He can fill this up, and when he's done, just drain the water back into the system. Uh, packing station right here behind him, boxes, styros, lids. Uh, another system right here, and I believe the next slide you'll be able to see this filtration. Uh, no. Um, even the little, littlest things that you think about, like these ball valves, one of the pieces of plumbing that fails the most are, are valves. So all these valves are put in to be threaded. So if one fails, you can just take it out and replace it. Um, overflow standpipe, I love this. We're doing all sorts of screens and all sorts of different things on mine, and I go see his, and all he did was take a straight vertical PVC pipe, three saw cuts, and he's got teeth and an overflow, and it works perfectly. So sometimes the simplest things. This is his biofilter, and it's actually crushed coral underneath, plastic media above, all these tanks just drain down onto this polyester batting, that's his mechanical filtration, you can see how dirty it gets. Just takes it up, whisks it away, lay down a fresh piece, and he's good to go. Really simple, and this works very well for him. And again, notice that the, the sump is just built out of plywood. You know, it's not treated plywood, and it's all been fiberglass coated, so it's not, it's inert. Uh, but really neat way to build very usable tanks of any size very cheaply. Um, and again, this is not about looks. This is about utility. And that, like I said, the actual room was designed to be a fish room. So it actually slopes right down to this little point right here. And this is a drain to the outside. So any, any spills, any, anything overflowing goes to a floor drain and goes to the outside. Um, up above, I've got a dehumidifier and then an air conditioner for the room. This is based on Florida in the Keys. So obviously it gets hot and humid down there. Um, and this is you know, just one more look at his, at his facility. You can see everything is very clean. But every little nook is, is well utilized. Uh, the big sumps underneath these holding tanks hold big fish. Um, just some examples of some of the fish that were down there when I was uh, going through. So again, here's the lessons I took from Tom. Utilizing that overhead area for storage, because that's that space is not space we normally go to. So it's a great place to get things out of the way. Um, you don't have to over-engineer these wood stands. They were actually just put together with wood screws, very basic, and they are plenty strong. Um, I loved those fiberglass coated tanks. And then you'll notice again behind them, these 10 gallon tanks. These are just rows of 10 gallon tanks. He said they're very simple for keeping things segregated and very cheap compared to using like the acrylic cubicles that they sell for retailers. So the next guy is Jay Hansen. He's one of uh, my club members up in Minnesota. Jay is a coral master. He grows, grows fantastic SPS. When I have an SPS question, when I want to know how to do something, I go talk to Jay. And when Jay wants to breed fish, he comes talk to me. Um, his fish room is like a laboratory. It is spotless. It is beautiful. Um, and I like to joke, he's proof that green tubs work. He couldn't find a black tub. He used a dark green tub. It worked just fine. Um, so this is a bad day in Jay's fish room. Um, and he's not breeding too much. He's just got the one tub going. Quarantine system underneath for his display system. RODI is over by the utility sink. It's really nice to have that utility sink in the room. Um, and he's spawning gold striped maroons. They're spawning on a tile. And his very first run, he did pretty well. Um, hundreds and hundreds of maroons in that tub. And uh, get a little closer look there. So that was his first time ever. So it is proof that you can go into this and be successful right off the bat. Uh, and some of the things that I took from Jay, he, he took a year building this fish room. He did not just jump into this. Um, and he, he looked and said, you can never have too much power. You can never have enough ventilation. You can never have enough space. The moment he finished the fish room, he turned around and said, I didn't need that bathroom. So he's already going, man, I should have never built that bathroom. I could have had so much more space in this fish room. So he was kind of saying, take as much space as you can get away with, because you will use it. Um, 
Jim Blagan is a, he's running Seahorse Northwest up in Oregon. He's another new breeder. Uh, he has his hatchery in the garage. It's a very small space. Um, from here to the table to there, that's his, that's his hatchery. It's absolutely tiny. It's about the space of a one car parking spot. Um, but he planned it out very thoroughly and it paid off. Uh, he's a man with good priorities. He knows what's up. Um, and uh, this is his fish room. This is a one car parking spot. And he's got tons of stuff going on in here. Uh, this is his, if you walk in the door, this would be like over here. And again, using that overhead space for storage because you don't want to put fish tanks up there because just that's a pain in the butt. You're never going to want to go in them. You're never going to want to take care of them. Overhead is a great, great place for storage. Um, everything in here can kind of be moved around. Um, this is a batch of seahorses he had going. This is a little mini Chrysler. I was talking about this earlier in our question and answer. And uh, this is looking at it from above. And you kind of see the bubbles coming up. And I'll go back now. The bubbles rising up here create this very gentle circulation. And just a very gentle current and allow the seahorses to kind of face into the current, pick off food that's brought to them, have a very easy existence, expend as little energy as possible to, to grow up and survive. And then just a little bit of screening on the side to keep them in, but to allow water exchange with the larger tank system at a whole so it doesn't get polluted so quickly. And he did quite well, and we actually uh, had some good luck with the roadie feast, getting them to, uh, to eat that initially, which was a little bit of a surprise. Randy was there, and he didn't have his rotifers going, and I said, Randy, you got some roadie feast in the car. Sure enough, it did get some response. And uh, simple things like this really make a big difference in a fish room. This is just a, a fold away, fold out workspace. This is normally where you walk, but if he needs a spot, just fold it up, lock it in place. He's got a little workspace, and when he's done, just put it, put it away. You know, that dehumidifier in his space, that's what he's got to use. Just a little portable dehumidifier. But it's only a one car parking spot that he has to dehumidify, so it's really not that big of a deal. And he's got some really fantastic looking brute stock. So the lessons I took away from Jim is that you can do a lot in a small space. Jim went and talked to a lot of people. He did a lot of learning before he ever went out and said, I'm ready to do this. And that pre-planning really helped him maximize that space. And what he also found is, you know, Ikea, if you have access to Ikea, it's a great place to get space saving ideas, like that fold away bench. Uh, and you'll see Ikea showing up in some other places where you just, it's just there. And, Seamless. Uh, David Durr is right up by Jim. They're, they're good friends, and David runs Clownfish Northwest. And he is a clownfish propagator. He is known up there for having a clownfish house. I like to say that David is Mr. Clean. His place is always looking impeccable. Of course, he says, well, I never show you when it's not. And uh, he's got a real diversity of filtration. So I showed you this fish room earlier. This is how his bird stock started, in his living room. And his wife said, yeah, this is getting a little out of hand. So let's put it outside in a building. And, uh, you know, so this is kind of like you might have for like an artist's studio or something. Well, for David, it's, it's a clownfish hatchery. And this is what it looks like. Everything is clean. He didn't go two stories up because he had the vertical space at this point. Uh, or he had plenty of horizontal space, rather. So if he ever needed to grow, he's got plenty of room that he could add on. Uh, but everything is just impeccable, clean. He thought to put in storage. Notice the tile floors. There's no problems if there's water getting on that floor. <clears throat> everything is spotless and impeccably maintained. And uh, uses everything. A multi-pronged approach to dealing with the problem of nutrients. Protein skimmers, fluid isant beds, refugiums, live rockets, all going in there. Um, I loved how everything was dovetailed. Really nice. You, you never see this. You, you are never going to see this. The only person who knows it's there is David. But he took the time to really think it through so that these tanks are nice, everything was clean. Uh, you can pull these tanks out to clean them when he needs to, so that's not hard plumbed. And he gets fantastic results. Absolutely stunning results out of his tanks. And it's just paying attention to the details up front made this so much easier for him to, to actually accomplish. So the things I took away from David, that all that wood is painted, it really brightens up the room, and it waterproofs everything. Um, he really thinks about what's gonna happen, he's got generators on hand, ready to go, um, and he really, really wanted to emphasize, consider every method available to deal with nitrates, to deal with the pollution that the fish create. Don't just go with any one, use them all. 
Tal Sweet, I believe some of you guys may know Tal. He, he's up in Michigan. He's uh, one of the founders of the Marine Breeding Initiative. Um, he's a hobbyist breeder. He's got a really well-established side business at this point, um, and uh, he really likes blue. He really likes the color blue. And uh, so this is a good example of a fish room that was first planned up on with SketchUp. And you'll look at this fish room, you'll see these black round tubs for larval rearing, a little bit of a larval hatcher area slash uh, uh, early stage, and then you'll go into grow out. And he, he lumps his brood stock together with his grow out. I don't agree, but no one, no one has to agree with me. And uh, then he's got this area for culturing and, and housing other things. So this is how he planned out his room. And when you look at the actual pictures, you can see it. You can see this is the food culture. Here's the brood stock. Here's the, the area where I hatch. Um, he even painted the PVC blue. It's, it's, it's a place you're going to spend a lot of time. So if you want to make it aesthetically pleasing, you should. Um, and you know, culturing rotifers here. He's got his egg tumblers going on here for hatching gaudybacks, phytoplankton being grown above, uh, a little bit of a quarantine tank right there. Simple things, simple things. He uses these colored uh, magnets to track pairs, to track when they spawn and when they're gonna hatch. So it keeps everything organized. He knows exactly what he has to do every day. Uh, really simple. This is a larval, larval culture system using black ground tubs on a central system. There's only two tubs on the system and he's using a turf scrubber down below and kind of just slowly recycling the water through. Most of the water is being constantly recirculated here very slow drips through the larval system so that you're not blowing the babies into the filtration. And another look, this is just a simple hatching where he's pulling out tiles and doing some of his early larval rearing on clownfish. They don't need black round tubs, so don't use black round tubs. That's his motto and he gets good results. Some band guys, some baby, uh, baby perks there. So one of the things Tal doesn't have in this room is water. He has to haul water from the other end of the house. This is a spare bedroom that he's turned into a fish room. He really misses having water. One of the things he just wanted to convey, you can do it and you can make it as simple or as large as you want, but he also wanted me to tell everyone you don't need to start out with seven or eight pairs. It's possible to just do this all with one, see if you like it. Kind of echoes my earlier sentiment of start small and grow slowly. Um, and he really also wanted to convey that breeding marine fish is the right thing to do for the future of our hobby. It's where we're gonna need to be 10, 20, 50 years from now. We're gonna need a lot more captive propagation. So Rod Bueller, some of you guys may know Rod from Rod's Food, um, or you may know him from Rod's Onyx. We like to joke and say he is Mr. Onyx Pakula himself. Uh, while Sequest is the originator of their line of Onyx, I don't think anyone has really pushed Onyx more into the mainstream than Rod. Um, he's really a good frozen food guy. His food is fantastic, I love it. Uh, he runs his systems very differently from all the other systems we've looked at. He runs very natural systems. Uh, and Rod is very much all about the surge. So this is Rob Bueller's uh, fish room, and uh, it's occupying the whole middle section of this building. And this is what it looked like. Uh, totally different from all the other fish rooms we, we've looked at so far. All his tanks are run with live rock, deep sand beds, metal halides above them, all his clownfish brood stock have anemones. Um, everything up here, these are all surge devices, all dump buckets, surge devices. Rather than using MP10s or Coralias or any of these other surge pumps, He's just using a very simple gravity-fed surge. And uh, he really likes the results he gets with that. And it costs less money. You don't have the electricity bill for that. Um, just another look at how things are done here. Totally different from the other stuff we've looked at. It's a, a Clarky down there tending a nest right there under this gigantic anemone in a horse trough. And he really gets good results. Everyone knows him for his onyx perks. There's one of those surges going off. Tons of water movement with almost no electric behind it. Um, and lots of skimmers. Everything in here, he built this uh, kind of walkway behind his lower set of tanks so he could get to everything from behind. Um, and you can't really see it right now, but there's actually two screens on this. This is one of his grow out systems. And he has this first screen and then the second screen. So the babies have to go through two sets of screens before they could ever possibly end up in the sump. It was just a very simple, solution to, is an extra form of insurance to keep the fish out of the filtration. Um, this is rotifer culture. Rotifer culture does not have to be anything complex. Five gallon buckets, very simple. So it's just set off to the side. Um, and this is again some examples of where he's hatching. He's hatching his babies in five gallon tanks. He's only doing clownfish. We know clownfish are perfectly okay to do in regular glass tanks. So again, you're not going to see any black round tubs here. Uh, but the results kind of speak for themselves. He has a 
very well-known reputation for producing really fantastic fish. So the things I took away from Rod, there's this really unintentional benefit, but the, nat the natural broodstock setups, they add a lot more visual appeal to his fish room than when I'd go out and look at broodstock systems where it's, there's a pair of oscillaris in a box, there's another pair of oscillaris in a box, another pair of oscillaris in a box. It's much more enjoyable to have these natural systems. Um, but you know, he's not cramming in 50 pairs of broodstock into a small space. He's at a much calmer level. Um, and it doesn't have to be as hard as people think it does. That was, that's Rod's real ben benefit uh, of experience as a breeder. He tends to think people overthink this. Um, and he said, don't be afraid to try something even if someone says you can't do it. And that's probably a piece of advice I tried to, tried to convey earlier on. Just because it's difficult, just because you fail a bunch of times doesn't mean don't do it. Um, Edgar Diaz runs Addy's Own Hatchery in Michigan. He is a former breeder for Sequest. He has a basement situated hatchery. His, his house was built. He knew that the basement was gonna be a hatchery area, so he has a little extra vertical height. Um, everything in Edgar's basement is really simple. And he has very extensive larviculture systems. So this is a good panoramic view of Edgar's basement. This is a, uh, it's a real long laid out system. You can see the larval culture systems here. This is primarily broodstock. Uh, these bigger tubs are for grow out. Um, and then he's got some more broodstock pairs over here. And again, notice all the electrical is being run up to the ceiling. And uh, everything is just lit with ambient light. There's no lights down on the tanks. You can see in just fine with a bunch of shop lights. Um, and that, actually, that's another view right there uh, of the left side. You can see the filtration, the big skimmer. Um, and notice he's just using cinder blocks and wood frames to hold these tanks up. Nothing complicated, just some backbreaking labor to haul a bunch of cinder blocks into your basement, but uh, it's strong, it's not going anywhere, and it costs them next to nothing to build it. Um, these are the larval culture systems again. Any of these can be taken offline and run as a stand standalone system. He uses the smaller ones for larval and the larger ones generally for grow out. And um, this little handy device here, you, you can see the water exits through the side, and it is screened. You can see hundreds of clownfish running around in there. But that little device right there is not a feeding ring. It's a ring to keep the food from going down the surface overflow. So when he feeds, that ring gets turned and the food is put outside of that ring. And he gets fantastic results. I was blown away by the quality of fish that Edgar rears and his filtration is you know, like, like, like Tupperware storage bins full of bio balls. That's it. You know, it's, it's something about keeping it simple and just doing the work. There's no substitute for it. The black round tubs do play a really important part in producing better fish, helping the fish grow better. So these are six month old onyx perpulas. This is insane. No one else I know can do this. Mine at six months of age would all be pretty much orange, maybe showing a touch of black. Most people's are like that. These are ready for market at six months. This is unheard of. So Edgar's definitely doing something right. These are juvenile neon dotybacks. This is fantastic. This blows anything you can do in freshwater right out of the water. This is a 10 gallon tank. These fish were like this big. I want to take them all home. This is fantastic. Um, everything about Edgar was very simple and it saved them money and it was very efficient. Those black round tubs on those central systems were by far the best larval systems I had seen. They produced the best results. He was able to do a much more diverse array of fish. He had a lot more than just clownfish and dottybacks in that hatchery. He's got royal gramas, he's got comets, he's got dotty, uh, gobies. He has a lot of species he produces, just doesn't do them consistently. But because he's using those black round tubs, he can do any of those species that need it. It's very simple. If you do fish that, if you use glass tanks for your larval tanks, you're limited to what you can grow in a, in a glass tank. Um, everything in his system, anything new that comes in, is quarantined for two months in another room. It doesn't even enter the fish room for two months. I'm very serious about quarantine and preventing anything get in. Because once it's in, he's done if he brings in something. You wipe out your brood stock, you're starting over, and that's not fun. So Joe Lichtenberg ran Reef Propagations Inc. in Illinois for 20 plus years. He retired in 2010. Um, he had this beautiful basin hatchery. Um, he raised over 200,000 documented clownfish because he kept track of, kept meticulous records. Joe is the one who sold me on modular systems. And so this is again, I showed you, showed you this earlier. This is Joe's 
main broodstock system, but he had two additional broodstock systems, and they weren't modular. But what are modular are his grow-up systems. What he did was he built the one, got it working the way he liked it, and then replicated it, built two more. So that way he wasn't trial and error on three systems at the same time. He just started with one, get it perfect, and make two more. Again, all of his electric is up at the ceiling. Uh, all these systems, these are just six, six 20 gallon tanks. So there's 120 gallons capacity up above. And then a big sump below, ultraviolet sterilizer. Not, not too complicated. He's using DLS rolls for his biological filtration and water changes. And just absolutely jam packed with fish. This, this hatchery supported two regional wholesalers and two local fish stores. And they bought everything he could produce. Uh, this is his dehumidifier, saving the heat from that dehumidifier, pumping it right upstairs to heat the house. Water storage and water mixing, just very basic right there, but you gotta have it. And again, tons of fish, but all these tanks have a, uh, they're on the central filtration, a lot had air feeds running in them, but he did fantastic things with very little space. His hatchery was again about the size of this, this area right where you're all sitting, it wasn't a ton of space. And uh, those modular systems, for me, those were a no-brainer. He had one backup for the UV, he didn't have to have three different kinds. Um, build one, tweak it, replicate it, get it working right. Uh, Joe was really a proponent of being clean, clean, clean all the time. If you stay ahead of the, the mess, ahead of the pollution, it's, e it's just easier to stay on top. If you let things go, things start to go bad really quick. And then uh, this quote from Joe, breeders beat nature, Every pair in nature simply replenishes itself. Every pair only needs to make two fish that make it. In his basement, he beat out Mother Nature 10,000 times over. Every pair of fish produced thousands, if not tens of thousands of babies in his care. Far more productive than anything Mother Nature's gonna do. So now we're going to me. I'm formerly from Chicago, now I'm in Minnesota. Um, I am going to go into more details because I can, it's my talk. Um, I went around and learned from everyone else and applied what I knew and what I found to the resources I had. Uh, I like to say that I have a slowly growing fish room. I don't have the fish room I want, I have the fish room I can afford. Um, and I have this beautiful unfinished basement to play around in. So this is where I started up in Chicago. This is where I was breeding in this little tiny condo right here. This is where I did a lot of the stuff that people know me for. Uh, but then we bought this beautiful house in Duluth and I really got busy breeding. And um, <laughs> seriously though, seriously though, um, this, is, this is what I, I came, came, came home to. Unfinished basement, very raw space, had this gigantic concrete sink, and I said, that's gotta go, that's atrocious. Then I found out how much that was gonna cost to get out, and I said, that's gotta stay right here. Um, this is my zooplankton culture. I don't culture phytoplankton anymore. The reality is, is the pace are much more economical. They do what I need them to do. So at this point, I'm not culturing any phytoplankton. I've got rotifers, I can hatch brine shrimp right here. This is right by the sink. Um, this is my water station right now. There is a workbench sitting right there. Why, why, I don't need to get rid of it. Just use it. So mixing up in a 45 gallon brew, 30 gallon RO storage, just pull five gallons in, dump them in, I can control it, mix it all. It's, it's much, much more easy than I used to have to do it. And uh, just dual stage RO right down here, RODI with uh, takes care of everything, it's beautiful. And this is how my fish room starts out. A lot of used tanks, metal stands, you know, they're easy to come by. Craigslist is a wonderful thing. This is old school, this is, you know, like you treat with fresh water, but everything does just fine. Because I'm not putting tons of fish, these are brood stock tanks. There's only a pair of fish in here, and a pair of fish in here, and a pair of fish in here. So you don't need a lot of filtration, it doesn't take a lot of work. The system's not gonna crash on you, because it's just two fish in a tank, it's not a big deal. Um, these are the old tanks. This is what I did most of my breeding with in Chicago. My harlequin filefish used to live in this tank, in this tank, in this tank. My black oscillator pair still lives in this tank, a six gallon nanocube. You know, you don't have to have this massive fish room to do a lot, but I am planning. You can tell I'm planning. I'm working on it. There are that, and that's just what you can see because it keeps on going. Um, so that's another look at, at the room as you turn around a little bit more. So give me an idea. Over here is where the sink is, my furnace. This is the larval culture system we built. This is the first thing we actually set out and said, I'm gonna build, I've got the space, I'm gonna do it. I told you guys, I'm not a fan of carpentry. I, I'm, I'm not very power tool literate, so I used commercial shelving. This is just epoxy coated baker's rack. These are all black ground tubs. 
uh, I plumbed everything up front so I could see it, so I could easily access it. Everything is readily available to me. This is just a storage box. The urinal is not a urinal. If you pee in it, you're kicked out of my house. This is where I pour my water in. So when I designed this, I, I knew this was a larval culture system. So I knew I wanted these to be readily accessible, to be taken offline, to be cleaned. Everything had to be modular. So each one of these uses a clamp light. It has a 100 gallon heater in it. Um, they're all drilled down here at the bottom. Um, and so all the plumbing in the actual black ground tub is not hard plumbed either. It's all slip fittings. So if I want to run the tank low, I can do that. If I want to fill it up and run it high, I can just use different sections of PVC and change, change the environment. If I want to drain it from the middle, I can run the standpipe out to the center and drain from the middle. If I want to drain from the side, I drain from the side. And um, even something as simple as the way water comes in. Maybe I want to try a 90 degree bend and try and get some circulation going like this. Maybe I want a 45 degree bend to kind of push it towards the bottom. You can see the sponge filter in here. It's ready to go if I need to take it offline. It's fully cultured, ready to go. This, this system can run as an independent standalone tank if it needs to. <clears throat> and it's really easy to take it off if I need to do something with it. If I need to take it out, just pull the drain out. It's not hard plumbing. Just drain it into the sump. Pop out the feed, throw the drain back in, take off the light, and all of a sudden, uh, you might remember I said these aren't hard plumbed. It just pops right out. I can take it over to that utility sink, wipe it out, clean it out, do whatever I need to do with it, and then bring it back in. In this case, I was taking a standalone rearing to set up, set up just another black round tub that I was running on the basement floor and uh, moving all the babies into this to put them on the system. And then bring it back over, open up the valve, fill it back up. Very simple. So that allowed me to get, have a lot of flexibility with my larval culture system. So when I go out and talk, people always want to know what's new, what am I working on now? And uh, this is one of my best successes, I want to say this was last year, the, the Flavia Vertex uh, Dottybacks, the Sunrise Dottybacks. This was with new food, and the first time I had really had an opportunity to use a black ground tub instead of a 10 gallon tank. And so I got like 700 Sunrise Dottybacks on my very first run. It was fantastic, it was awesome. Uh, I'm working on the Starkey Damsels. This is uh, my, one of my goals. I, at this point, my pair is spawning, I know it. I've seen the ovipositors down cannot find where they're laying the eggs because their tank is full of live rock. Normally, you can't even keep two of these in the same tank. They will kill each other. Even in a 200 gallon tank, that's normal normal protocol, but I have them in a 20 gallon with a pair of clownfish and tons of rock, and it seems to work. So maybe I found a way to keep a pair together without them killing each other. I mentioned it earlier, I'm working on butterflies. I'm working on four-eyed butterflies, I love them. They actually happen to be fantastic aptasia eaters. They don't seem to bother any of the SPS in my reef tank. So, great fish, difficult to keep alive, but it's one of my favorites even from being a kid, so that's one of the fish I'm trying to breed. Um, I'm also working with the rock beauties, I mentioned that earlier, trying to pair them up. Um, a lot of people said you wouldn't be able to keep multiple holocanthus together in a tank. We're starting to figure out that's not entirely true. Um, green blotch parrotfish, fantastic fish. This is a dwarf parrotfish, it only gets about four inches long perfectly fine to put in a reef tank, eats algae. Um, and since we bought this new house, I finally have the opportunity to have a display tank. So I'm playing around with this display. Uh, this display is lit with PAR38 par 38 LED lights from uh, Ecozotic. And uh, this is the tank before I had it set up. Ikea shades, you know, you could do some really fun and interesting things design-wise if you just get out of the, the standard and start thinking about different things. And uh, this also, I said, it's a 92 corner tank but I've got a basement. I can put a big sump downstairs. I'm not gonna buy a big tank. I'm gonna use a 300 gallon Rubbermaid trough. So I said, oh, okay, I'm gonna bring it in. Yeah, this will work. Well, no, it didn't really fit. So we had to take apart the stairs and the stairs had to come out. You know, you have to be willing to, I, to learn. I'm not a carpent, carpenter, but I said, you know what? It's worth it to me to get this 300 gallon trough in the basement. So we couldn't come in through the side, so we brought it through the house. And this is the door from the kitchen that goes into the basement. That's the door to the outside from the basement. And uh, we kind of lowered it down and we get it in. And we're all excited, but it won't go straight down the stairs because the stairs upstairs drop down like this. So maybe we can turn it. Maybe we can kind of slide it in. And we get here 
And that's as far as it got. It gets to here, and we're like, wait, it won't go through. We flip it around, we try it another way. We get this close, and it's stuck. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really angry at this point. I'm going, this, this, this was, why didn't this work? This had to work. And Mike looks at it and says, oh no, it was just hung up on this. And boom, straight into the basement, no problem. And uh, so that's the sump that's sitting underneath that 92 gallon tank, a 300 gallon Rubbermaid trough. So when those, when those queen angels and rock beauties get too big, this is where they'll probably go retire as brood stock. Um, and so this is the tank as I had it set up. And uh, doing a, a biotope type theme, Gorgonians, Caribbean cultured live rock, a uh, pair of queen angels, pair of rock beauties, uh, had a, actually had spawning on the uh, green blotch parrotfish, which was awesome because they were only about this big. So think of them as little algae-eating fairy wrasses. That's how I like to think of them. The, you know, they're, they're attractive. They're a nice red color on the females. This is a female that just started turning male. They get way more attractive than that. But they were already spawning. And then the tank crashed. I'm not immune to failure. I had an ink outbreak. Came in on the live rock because I didn't quarantine the live rock. I quarantined everything else. Didn't quarantine the live rock. And uh, yeah, in the span of about two weeks, this whole tank went down and I saved uh, this queen angel, this rock beauty, and a handful of other fish, but I lost a lot of fish. So now the tank is sat fallow and now fish are starting to go back again. So I just sat back, but I'm not gonna let that stop me. And then I've got this tank running. This is the Ecozotic, the little one that holds the lightning room. And uh, I'm really impressed, this is actually horrible coloration on this, on this SPS, it looks great now. Um, I just didn't have time to swap it out for a newer picture, but I'm getting really fantastic growth out of the LEDs for next to nothing in electricity. And as the podium's growing like crazy, the ORA red Ganyapura is just fantastic under this lighting. Um, that, that, this is like twice the size now, it's just massive. Um, and then there's this guy. And uh, yeah, they're, they're paired now. And uh, the male was spawning when I was holding this male back. It was spawning with the gold stripe maroon. So the male is a proven male. And we're just in a waiting game. We're just waiting to see. It's going to take time for the lightning to become a female, become sexually functional. And then who knows if we'll ever get lightning babies out of it or if they'll all look like this guy. So that's what's going on there. So my lessons. What I took from everything and everyone is that fish rooms always change. They're in a perpetual state of doing something, redoing something, building, tearing down. It is the ultimate perpetual do-it-yourself project. If you are a do-it-yourself kind of person, you're gonna love having a fish room. You will never run out of ideas and things to improve upon and change. There is no one right way to do this. There is absolutely no one right way to set up. So don't let that intimidate you, because it intimidated me. It was scary to say, well, I don't know which pump to use, or if I should use three-quarter inch plumbing instead of half inch plumbing here. Th there's no right answer to that. You're gonna have to figure that out. Um, but you can learn on the job. And the nice thing is that marine fish breeding is measured in years. When I got that lightning maroon, people after about a year were like, oh, Matt Peterson is a hack, he doesn't know what he's doing. Some clownfish take five years before they even spawn for the first time. So you have to put things in perspective and think of things on a longer time scale. This is not an instant gratification type project. Um, so I say embrace your passion, feed that addiction, join us in the deep end, and uh, I have some acknowledgments to show. Uh, lots of people said yes, please show my freshwater fish room so the marine hobbyists can see how we do it. Uh, I went around and I think I visited more than 13, now. I think it's up to 16, but not every one of these people was in the talk today. Uh, a lot of people helped out making this possible and I uh, want to thank them and thank you guys and thank Mike for having us here and letting us be in the space today. Thank you.